All right, good. So oh, here are just a couple examples of anophthalmic sockets. Okay, so question number one. What is an ideal size orbital implant? 16, 18, 20, or 22 millimeters? A 20 millimeter sphere. Okay, all right. Number two, what is a potential risk of evisceration compared to enucleation? So poor prosthesis motility, superior sulcus deformity, spread of ocular tumor, or implant extrusion? Uh, spread of ocular tumor, all right. Which is not a treatment option for superior sulcus deformity? Placement of a thicker or larger prosthesis, injection of filler or fat into the orbit, removal of ocular implant and placement of a dermis fat graft, um, or placement of a subperiosteal wedge implant. Placement of a thicker, larger prosthesis, okay. All right, so our objectives are to discuss Inuk versus Evis, uh, talk about some tips and trips in preventing implant exposure, uh, discuss the management of the anophthalmic socket syndrome, uh, and then review options in managing the contracted socket. So first, let's think about the indications because depending on why the patient is having you know, their eye taken out, it can determine which one you really should or should not be doing as an option. So endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis is the infected eye that has to come out so that it doesn't spread the orbital to the orbit. Typically, they've failed the intravitreal antibiotics. Scleritis, this could be an autoimmune type scleritis um, with intractable pain, or it could be like a fungal or other type of bacterial scleritis as well. So you're trying to get the sclera out to prevent the persistent infection. Uh, a blind, painful eye, typically from like neovascular glaucoma or severe glaucoma, intraocular tumors like retinoblastoma, choroidal melanoma, um, and then irreparably ruptured globes, which I always say, don't do it you know, immediately. Like give them some time to process it mentally, at least like a few days. Uh, so considerations, let's say, well, let's ask a few questions. So which is easier and less invasive? So I think all of us would agree that evisceration is easier. You don't have to detach the muscles. You know, it's a quicker surgery, um, et cetera. So how about risk of sympathetic ophthalmia? So I'd say, you know, assuming it's intact. So theoretically, um, evisceration has a slight you know, risk of sympathetic, even though it's extremely rare. Um, how about in the setting of prior incisional intraocular surgery? So some of my con colleagues feel that if they've had prior vitrectomy or, you know, you know, PKP or, you know, or, you know, basically the antigens of the eye have come out once, you know, they think, oh, maybe we don't want to open the eye and expose it again. Um, I'm not sure there's a huge evidence for that, but, you know, it's a consideration. Um, how about in the setting of a ruptured globe? Um, sometimes, you know, I think either one is a possibility, uh, but uh, sometimes if the globe is really ruptured, you know, it's, it might be a little, the tissues may be a little bit compromised when you're trying to put an implant in if you're trying to do a EVIS. Still possible. Um, there's also the uh, thought of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia too. Uh, spread of infection. Um, sometimes people think about evisceration as not spreading the contents into the orbit. That said, you know, for like a treated uh, infection, I will sometimes take it out you know, irrigate the orbit with antibiotics or uh, betadine and then still put in an implant. Or you, if you're worried, you could also wait, give it a month to cool down and then go in and put in a secondary implant. Um, spread of intraocular cancer. This is one of the reasons why I don't like <laughs> doing evisceration. So um, I, I've heard of people having cases of a diffuse infiltrative melanoma that's very easy to miss even on, you know, a clear view to the fundus. Um, certainly, if you have media opacities and you don't have a clear view, you know, you definitely have to do a B scan. But even some of these infiltrating ones are very easy to miss. And so, you know, since I've heard people having that happen, I'm always thinking about that. Um, so, enucleation, again, doesn't open up the eye to, to potentially spread those uh, cancer cells. Um, scleritis and panophthalmitis. So, if you have infected or inflamed sclera, uh, that has to come out, so you can't leave it 
you know, and do it you vis because that a nidus of infection and inflammation. Um, and then titus bulbi, if they ha that in itself is not an indication for enucleation. They can always wear a scleral shell um, over the, the tysical eye. But um, if they have tysis bulbi and other issues like blind painful eye with tysis or pre -tysis, then typically the sclera is so small that to put an adequately sized implant in is very difficult. So I typically prefer enucleation. So I'm just keeping track of time here. So let's talk a little bit about orbital implants. So it's very important to place a large enough implant, you know, if possible. And I typically like to place a 22 millimeter implant. Some people will go even bigger than that. Um, but, you know, if there are issues like a lot of conjunctival scarring, um, you can sometimes have a higher chance of extrusion if you put too big of an implant. So bigger is not always better. <laughs> uh, porous versus non-porous implants, um, this is always a controversial thing. I typically use porous. You know, I know people who always use non-porous. And I think the truth is that you can generally have good outcomes with either one. Uh, there's some studies showing that there's higher extrusion and exposure rates with the non-porous ones, which have a rough surface. But there's also people who have published their results in, with almost zero, uh, zero incidence of exposure with porous implants. So I think it really depends on your surgical technique, uh, but probably non-porous is slightly um, you know, better in terms of exposures and extrusions. Um, Porous would be calcium hydroxyapatite or porous polyethylene. Non-porous would be things like silicone, acrylic, um, or if you're in a setting where you don't have implants available, um, I heard that people in, sometimes you know, will use marbles even, um, and it still fills the space. Not necessarily approved as an implant, but you know, it seems to work. <laughs> um, risk of exposure, extrusion, infection, we kind of talked about it. When you have a porous implant, if it gets seeded with infection, it gets embedded in the implant. It's very difficult to clear the infection. It typically has to be taken out. Um, and uh, scleral wrapping. Some people will wrap their implants with sclera. I typically don't, um, but some people think of it as being a little bit of a barrier. I don't think it's really necessary. Um, attachment of the extraocular muscles. So if you have an acrylic implant or a marble, it's very difficult. I mean, you can't really attach the muscles to the implant itself, um, whereas the porous ones, you can sew it through the porous implant, or some of them come with prefabricated tunnels where you can pass a suture through it um, and tie it off from the implant. Pegging, I'd say almost nobody does pegging these days because of the risk of uh, infections and complications. If you have the right patient who's like, I don't care, I just want to have the most natural movement possible, and I'm willing to, you know, have complications and possible need for further surgery, you can try pegging, but you have to read them the riot act and, and warn them. Um, and then cost. The, the non-porous tend to be much cheaper uh, than the, por the porous implants. So how, are, how about some tips for preventing exposure and extrusions? Um, first of all, I say beware of the infected and inflamed orbit. Uh, these patients not only have orbital inflammation, they typically have very con a lot of conge inflammation. The tissue can sometimes be a little bit ratty and necrotic. Um, and these are patients who, you know, um, when you have inflamed tissue trying to hold the implant in place, it's not going to hold and heal as strongly initially. So these are sometimes patients who I like to give them time to cool down for about a month, let the infection inflammation settle down, and then secondary, go back about a month later and put in a secondary implant. Um, other risk factors for exposure, any smokers, obviously they have poor wound healing, greater risk of infection, radiation, or types of cancers, you know, the blood supply and the tissue will be more friable, multi-operated patients for glaucoma, cornea, retinal surgery, you know, the, the scarring, again, the tissue has been compromised. Um, elderly patients don't heal as well as younger patients, um, and then immunosuppressed patients also. You know, the immune system is necessary for healing as well. And so they tend to have, um, you know, poor wound healing. Um, I also say it's very important to consider the individual patient. And that's a theme for all of everything we do in oculoplastics. So, you know, if it's a young 30-year-old patient who's lost her eyes, she's clearly aesthetically inclined, you really don't want to give her a superior sulcus deformity, enophthalmos, and everything. If it's one of my 90-year-old patients with an 
and off the Midas and his brow is so droopy that it's like you've been blocking his lid. And he's like, I don't care. I don't even want an ocular prosthetic. I don't want another surgery. I don't want anything. Then, you know, why take the chance of putting a, pushing the limits of a large implant if, you know, if they could get away with a small implant, then they don't, they don't even care about it. They just want to wear a patch. So um, it's always a trade-off. The larger implant gives better aesthetics, but, you know, and sometimes can cause higher chance of extrusion. Um, we talked about the sizing and the types of implants, attachment of the, the extraocular muscle. I think this is a, a underappreciated thing that's not taught that often. But you know, if you really advance the extraocular muscles to the anterior pole of the implant, you have a really robust vascularized layer that's serving as an extra barrier to extrusion. Uh, so some people attach the muscles kind of to the equator, the pseudo equator of the implant. But I like to form what I call the the anterior annulus of Zin. So think of it like putting all your four rectus muscles, you know, right up against each other, and that forms a really nice vascularized barrier for uh, for implant extrusion. The tenon's closure is really extremely critical, way more so than the conjunctival closure. This is what is going to hold the implant in place. You need to get good bites of tenons, close it sometimes in double layers, so there's no implant exposed at all. And then finally, manage your, um, your bleeding, you know, your risk of retrobulbar hemorrhage. If you have a retrobulbar hemorrhage, that's more likely to put a lot of pressure in the orbit and pop the implant and burst it through. So um, if they're on blood thinners or they have liver failure and their clotting factors are poor, you know, just be very mindful of that risk and talk to your patients about it. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about anophthalmic socket syndrome. We're running close to noon. But um, this is a triad of superior sulcus deformity, enophthalmos, and oftentimes lid malposition, typically like an ectropion, but sometimes also a ptosis as well. Um, and the most common cause is an inadequately sized orbital implant. Again, we said we ideally would like a 22 millimeter. This gentleman had an infected one, and he has no orbital implant in there. So you can see he's, everything is magnified. Um, the physiology has to do with like this posterior rotation of the tissues and the dispensary ligaments. It can be soft tissue atrophy from trauma, surgery, uh, from the eye removal. Um, and then sometimes the forces of the prosthetic weighing on the lower lid, it just accelerates the process of the involutional aging changes. It's a weight weighing down on the eyelid and it can cause ectropion and laxity. Uh, and then the, the treatment um, typically is um, you, can place a, you, can, you can actually place a larger prosthetic, a thicker prosthetic. It has a trade-off. So you can have a larger volume prosthetic that'll volumize the superior sulcus, but it's going to weigh more heavily on the lower lid. So over time, they'd be maybe more likely to have ectropion. Uh, but you can do that. Secondary implant, if they didn't have one, or an implant exchange, they got infected and they had an it needs to come out, make sure you put an adequately sized implant. A subperiosteal wedge is something that you kind of wedge it, you know, posteriorly under, like along the orbital floor. And that really helps to uh, fix the enophthalmus and the superior sulcus deformity. And then you can also do filler or fat transfer to the orbit to volumize the eye socket. Uh, this is a patient of mine who had a very contracted socket. She had multiple contracted socket surgeries with hard palate mucous membrane grafts. And she was unhappy with her cosmetic appearance here. And I was like, we are not going in and cutting through your conge and risking contracting your socket again. Um, so I actually did... Um, eight cc's of fat, fat grafting from her abdomen uh, to the orbit. I fa injected fat into the superior sulcus and to the lateral canthal region. And she still has her old prosthetic, which is very tiny and vaulted. But you can see how, um, you know, the superior sulcus has improved. Um, her enophthalmus is slightly better. And when she gets fit with the, the proper prosthetic, um, it's even better. Um, this is another patient of mine who had, like, like 12 prior socket and eyelid and facial surgeries prior to coming to see me. Um, and the problem with him was that he had an inadequately repaired orbital fracture. So here you can put in, first of all, he didn't have an orbital implant, as you can see on the axial. But even if you put in your 22 millimeter implant, you can see his orbital volume has been so grossly expanded that 22 millimeter, even a 24 millimeter, it's not going to fix things. He has to have the socket, the fracture repaired to recreate the properly sized orbit, and then he can get the, the implant placed. 
So finally, our last topic, contracted sockets. So our goal with contracted sockets is to, for the patient to be able to wear a prosthesis that's not going to be falling out all the time. If the patient says, I don't care, I don't want a prosthetic, I just want to wear a patch, don't put them through any more surgery because the whole goal is to, for them to wear a prosthetic. Um, it's typically due to conjunctival contracture and loss of the fornices, like you can see here. There's no pocket for the implant to fit in. You need a pocket below and you need a pocket above to fit the prosthetic. It's really a partnership between the ocularis and the oculoplastic surgeon. So I typically have them see the ocularis first, you know, see what they can do. If they say, no, it's, we can't do any more, they just need you know, surgery, then we go ahead and do surgery. But sometimes they can do what's called pressure conformers where they, it's kind of like stretching the fornix and recreating a pocket. And you can get some improvement there. Otherwise, we're talking about mucous membrane grafts, hard palate grafts, Sometimes a dermis fat graft is a nice option if you need volume plus, you know, a contracted socket um, repair. Um, and then sometimes they just have like a little bit of a symblepharon that's just popping it out and you just need to lyse a symblepharon. And you can, with that, you can just do like a little amniotic membrane graft for the repair of the symblepharon. Um, typically after all of these so contracted socket repairs, which are challenging surgeries, fraught with the same scarring problems we just talked about, you know, over the first three months, everything contracts again the graphs shrink, everything we talked about, but all of them typically get some blepharon rings or some type of bolster. Um, I put in a tar surfy to try to, you know, maintain that pressure on the fornices and they all get 5-FU, uh, sometimes even mitomycin in my clinic. Um, sometimes, you know, at the time of surgery and then repeating every one to two weeks or, you know, as needed. Um, but it's a very challenging surgery. Um, two days when we're going to do a mucous membrane graft. Uh, this is uh, our patient uh, who's coming in later today. Uh, so she had a last, oh, I'm sorry, tomorrow. You're right, tomorrow. This patient had a laceration through the eyelid, but you can also see there's all the scarring um, in, the, in the inferior fornix, and it's very shallow, especially medially. So um, you know, she's unable to retain a prosthesis. So we're going to do a mucous membrane graft to deepen the fornix for her. Uh, so in conclusion, you know, Inuk and Evis, um, they each have their pros and cons, but you know, there's certain cases where, you know, one's better than the other. Porous and non-porous implants are both reasonable and good options in the right patient. Um, a lot of it, the extrusions have to do with surgical technique, uh, but you also want to consider the size of the implant, the type, the risk factors for the individual patient. Um, anophthalmic socket syndrome, um, usually due to a small, in, inadequately sized implant, and we have various surgical or non-surgical, you know, filler or fat transfer type options to improve that. Um, and then contracted sockets are challenging cases. You know, they often require grafts and 5-FU. Um, but it is a marriage and a partnership with your ocularist. Um, so, all right, let's do quick voting. So what is an ideal size orbital implant? Um, 16, 18, 20, or 22 millimeters. And let's see what people said. 22, very good, 100%. Um, what is a potential risk of evisceration compared to enucleation? Yep. Uh, spread of ocular tumor. You can get superior socket. You can get all of the other things with enuc or evis. Um, but really, once you open the eye and, you know, let all the contents out, that's how you can spread intraocular tumors, uh, which is not a treatment option for superior sulcus deformity. So, uh, so actually... As we talked about, placement of a thicker and larger prosthesis is an option. You can do a larger volume prosthetic. It, ha it just has a little bit of trade-offs. It might cause more ectropion and laxity over time, but it, it, it will volumize the superior sulcus deformity. Um, removal of the ocular implant and the dermis fat graft. I'd say that's an option, but if you know, the ocular implant is extruding, but the problem with dermis fat grafts is it's very unpredictable. Um, you can't very, you know, predictably size the dermis fat graft, and then you can't predictably determine how much of it is going to atrophy over time. But I don't necessarily guarantee myself that I'm going to have an overall improvement in the volume. Uh, whereas with all of these other ones, you're only uh, augmenting volume. There's no chance of you having a decrease in volume or staying volume neutral. Um, okay, that's it.